there everyone. Before we begin, I just wanted to say thank you so much from the bottom of my heart to every single one of you who has been supporting the channel by watching and sharing the videos. Just a few days ago, we reached 99,000 subscribers. That's insane. I never thought I'd reach a thousand, but 99,000? That's a lot. So let's all work together to get that last 1,000, and let's reach that big 100,000 subscriber mark. I know we can do it. So make sure to subscribe if you're brand new, as I upload brand new Scary Stories videos each and every week. But with all of that said, let's get started with today's Scary Stories. I'm going to start off by saying that this was a widely publicized case, so few details are going to be changed, but the main part of this is accurate. Also, I am on mobile, so sorry for any errors. A few years ago, I worked at a popular hookah lounge in my town. We had many regulars, so of course I got to know many people and made some lasting friendships with a few of them. Among those regulars was a group of people I wasn't terribly fond of, except one girl, Rachel. Rachel was a kind girl who I enjoyed talking to. I just didn't approve the people that she hung out with or the decisions that she made. But it was her life, so what place did I have to say anything? Eventually, Rachel started dating another regular named Ben, who was part of my friend group. This is when we got a lot closer, and she started to trust me and confide in me more. Eventually, Rachel and Ben broke up, and it devastated Rachel. I clearly remember her asking to hang out, and her crying on my shoulder for half an hour. During their relationship, Rachel stopped hanging around the shady people as much, but of course afterwards, she went back to them and started partying a lot and doing who knows what. She stopped talking to me as much and eventually started dating some other guy in the shady group named Greg. Of course, that relationship went south due to reasons unknown to me, but Rachel ended up filing for a restraining order against Greg. A few days... I think, later, Rachel went missing and was never heard from again. It was awful. Her family started showing up to talk to me, asking if I'd seen her. I hadn't, but apparently somebody told them that she was seen downtown somewhere. It broke my heart. Well, one day, during a busy shift, someone we both talked to sometimes showed up and talked to me about Rachel's disappearance. His name is... P.O.S. P.O.S. told me he'd heard about her being seen somewhere and wanted to know what I knew about it. He even asked me if I'd heard if anything bad happened to her. I'm assuming he thought since I worked at a regular hangout spot of hers, I'd hear something. I told him I hadn't, and we hugged before he walked off to talk to other people. Months passed before I heard anything about Rachel. Her family showed up from time to time asking about her, but nothing changed. Around a year after her disappearance, the police had a breakthrough in her case, and her body was found. After some investigating, the police discovered that Greg had hired P.O.S. to kill Rachel, and he did. He would hide her body, and then continue life as usual. The fact that I spoke to P.O.S. after the fact, and even hugged him, still weighs in my conscious. It's been years, and I'm still so upset about it. He's in prison, and I'll likely never see him again, but it still hurts. I spoke to her family about her, having hugged the man who killed her. I wish I'd been a better friend to her. Maybe I could have saved her. I could have insisted that she not hang out with those people. I don't blame myself for her murder, but I do wish I could have done something. Had I been a more insistent friend, maybe she'd still be here. Who knows? All I really know is that, for whatever reason, if I ever do see him again, it's not going to be a good thing for him. He knew she was dead, and he still asked me if I'd seen her or heard anything about her. So, P.O.S., I hope you suffer. 
I felt I had to share this encounter because honestly I never thought I experienced something like this myself. Sure, I've read all the no sleep posts and freaked myself out, but this was different. This wasn't a scary monster or even a ghost. This was a close call, or so I believe. Some quick background leading up to the night in question. I'm graduating from university tomorrow, so I was determined to get an early night. I'd gone around to my friends for a wee spliff, but don't get me wrong, I'm not a pothead. It was more of a celebration. Anyway, I remember that I had to take my mom to the hospital. Nothing serious, but she had to be taken and picked up. Then I remembered we rolled the joint in the car. Disaster. She smelt it and saw it everywhere. So I made a mental note to stop and vacuum the car. We have a 24 hour petrol station really close to us, but it's sort of on its own as there are no houses or buildings around. I pull in and look over to the shop. They use a hatch after 12 and don't allow you inside, but I didn't need anything. It had just ticked over 4 a.m. and I had to be up at 10 a.m. So I wanted to just get this done and get out of here. The vacuum machine was behind the coal shed, but it was well lit. I cranked on some music on my phone and got to work. One pound for four minutes of vacuuming. Not bad, I thought. No one else was in the parking lot except one white van, but the guy inside was yelling wildly into his phone. Not loudly, just making a lot of gestures. I felt for him, probably some guy who had been driving all night. But hey, I cracked on with the work at hand. Then I looked over again and caught his eye. He looked away and I laughed. Love at first sight, I thought to myself. I was in an amazing mood. Then it started to get weird. The summer sun was already starting to rise and the street lights went out, including those illuminating the petrol station. It wasn't that dark, but it was noticeably creepier and I was keen to really get a move on. I stared over at the van and saw the man watching me again, still talking on his phone. But then something happened that I really, really freaked out at. I saw someone lean forward from the other seat and peek around the guy, and then immediately slam themselves back against the seat. That's when I realized the guy in the phone was in the passenger seat and wasn't driving. I hadn't noticed it when I drove in, but I shrugged it off and set the vacuum cleaner back, ready to leave. I threw all my stuff back into my car and went to unlock the door when a voice said, Excuse me? I swear, I nearly shat myself right there and then. My heart was absolutely pounding, but I recognized the voice. The petrol station was a spar, the same chain of stores I work in and the guy who had spoken was my old supervisor. He moved to the 24-hour store not too long ago. He began to shout at me for using the vacuum so late at night. The two guys in the van just sat and watched us, as if waiting for him to go away. Then he said something to me that made this whole situation real. I'm going to have to ask you to come inside. We aren't allowed to let customers in past 11, even in stores, then open until 12. This is a big no-no, especially as I knew I wasn't doing anything wrong. But I allowed him to lead the way, and the moment we were in the store, he put the shutter down. He told me he had been watching the guys in the van, and they had been sitting there for nearly three hours. Little did I know, my old supervisor saw someone get out of the back of the van, and as he described it, put a bit of masking tape across a few zeros in their number plate, effectively creating a new one. I began to panic. Looking outside, I noticed the van was gone. After checking the CCTV, it was shown that they sped away the minute I was taken into the store. Needless to say, we called the police and they examined what little footage was there immediately. They took the tape and thanked us for bringing it to their attention. At one point on the CCTV, the guy who got out of the back of the van turned to get back in, 
and it looked like he had a knife in his hand. I realize I do sound dramatic, and this story isn't exactly thrilling, but I cannot imagine what would have happened if my old supervisor hadn't been looking out for me. I am never vacuuming at 4am anymore. That's for sure. Today I drove into town for some preschool supplies for my son. I pulled into the parking lot and parked, no problem, and went inside to do my shopping. When I was finished, I came back out with my groceries and quickly found my car because I got lucky and was able to park near the front. An older woman, maybe in her 50s or 60s, was standing around without any bags or a cart that I could see. I didn't pay much mind to her at first because she was standing about 10 feet or a little over 2 meters from my car. Well, as I got closer to my car, she seemed to notice me all at once and suddenly made a beeline toward me. I got a good look at her at that point and I could see that her hair was dirty and tangled and her open mouth showed black gross teeth on the bottom and none on the top. She was wearing a crop top that looked stained or maybe she just had weird patterns on it and I think gray caprice. She didn't seem outright threatening at first but she didn't seem particularly happy. When she got up to my cart, she slapped the top right side with her hand and said, You took my damn spot, you fat bitch. I had no idea what she was talking about, but I'm pretty non-confrontational, so I just told her I was sorry and that I would be out of her way in just a minute. She told me that wasn't good enough because she had already had to park somewhere that she didn't want to be and she had a bad hip and how dare I get in the way, causing her to walk further. I turned to look behind me and pointed at the three empty handicap spots closer to the entrance. I asked if she had a handicap sticker and wanted to use those next time. She said, Bitch, if I wanted to use those spots I would bring my bastard with me. I have no idea if she meant a husband or a son, but I was royally freaked out. I apologized more and opened my trunk and just tried to get my groceries in the car. She yelled and cussed at me, slapping the side of my car for emphasis. People were literally walking past us and nobody was stopping to help. I'm terrified of confrontation and I just tried to keep calm so I could get out of there quick. I finally got my stuff in the trunk and closed it and the crazy lady got close enough I could smell old sweat coming off of her. She stretched her mouth out in this big ugly smile or a grimace expression and she had zero teeth on the top row, maybe seven or eight on the bottom, and she said, If you catch my spot again, I'll get my twenty-two and shoot you dead. Just you wait for me. Don't come down with anyone you think you ought not lose. I just held my hands up and promised I wouldn't and got in the car and left. I nearly hit her with it trying to back out, and I could see in the rear facing camera that she was slapping my car again. I went home, and I haven't told anybody about this. I didn't want to freak out my family, you know? I know I should have called the police, but they're useless in this town, and already didn't do shit when a man came at me in the same parking lot some time ago. They even caught him on camera but said it was probably nothing. Ugh. Anyway, I just wanted to share this weird ass story with all of you. I joined Reddit today to pretty much tell this story, though I'm a lurker on a ton of subreddits, so it's just nice to have an account now. I've told the story to my roommates, who are from the same town, and I've talked about it a few times with some of the people who were there, but that's it. I don't even like to talk about it, because inevitably someone will say, Really? We should go try and find it again. And I really don't want to. I've looked for it on a map a few times, but I can't find it. Though my male friend who drove there that night swears he has the directions memorized, 
that is through Google's aerial maps. Anyway, I'm originally from a major city in southern Ohio, and outside of town, there are a number of smaller townships. One of these is known as the more country bumpkin, redneck, and grit part of town. It's not even in the same county, but it is part of the general area in my city. In the woods, there is this legend of Hell's Church, supposedly an old church that burned down, where people who worship Satan do rituals now, or a Satan church that burned down by ritual, depending on who you ask. There are a number of Hell's Church myths in Ohio in many different places, but this one was closest to us, and a number of my guy friends decided they wanted to be ghost hunters and check out haunted places around where we lived. We were juniors in high school, and while all of us obviously thought this was just some stupid BS, we thought it was funny to go out and scare ourselves. Plus, most people had cars or driver's licenses by now, so we were enjoying a new burst of freedom. I'm a scaredy cat about most stuff like this, but I was the most tomboyish girl in the group and always kind of wanted to be able to hang out with the guys. Plus, some of the girls in the group, who I was closer to, were going, so I didn't want to look like a loser or a wuss. So one day in November, we decide we're going to go out one night and try and find this church. We'd actually been to this location once before that fall, but one of my friends had a curfew. So after exploring an old barn and the railroad tracks on a bridge nearby, we ended up leaving. We hadn't found the church, supposedly just a chimney at this point. To our disappointment and my mild relief, we took two cars out there going past more populous parts of our city and back to this woodsy area. Now, I can't honestly tell you how we got there, but I know it's off of a state highway, then an abandoned access road, past some old warehouse, and then down a dirt road. Once you get down the dirt road, there's a kind of thicker part of the road early on, where we part cars off of the shoulder. We did this because the road thins out and it becomes impossible to drive down. And also, someone clearly owns this land and later down the road there is some no trespassing signage. I'm sure a ton of kids come back here, so it didn't seem odd to me that they wanted to block this place off. I barely thought twice about it at the time. We get out of our cars and we start walking down the dirt road wandering off the path from time to time, so we can check out the barns or clearings where we thought the chimney might be. At first, it was just scary because it was dark and old or whatever, but then the barns started to get weirder, like they were filled with weird spray painting symbols and stuff like that. But that's not what bothered us. We figured whoever was there before us did it, which I still 100% believe but also other stuff, like dead owls that looked like they had been opened up, though they were dried out and decomposed by the time we got there, thank goodness, and other bits that looked like they might have come from animals. I was grossed out, but we all kind of agreed that these probably came from the same teenagers who were trying to fake a satanic ritual, or that the animals got trapped in the falling apart barn and ended up dying in there, then to be picked up by other animals. My friends are now hardcore trying to find this stupid chimney, so they keep taking off through the trees into clearings. Myself and the other two girls, who are there kind of hang back on the tree line for most of them, getting a little more nervous and a little irritated with all the coming up empty. As we keep going, we find a bike on the tree line, like a bike that maybe a 12 year old would ride. That's a little creepy, but fine, whatever. It probably belonged to someone who owned the land. So we decide we're going to go a little bit further, and soon enough, we find another bike. This one is older, a little rusted, but still undersized. We didn't talk too much about the other bike, 
just kind of mumbling that it's probably still nothing. One or two of the four guys who were there are kind of trying to tump it up, saying these kids probably got murdered or stuff like that, but no one is really having it. By this point, we've been here for about two hours and it's getting really late. Plus, I think we're all a little bit more creeped out than we wanted to admit. So we decide to head back to the cars and I'm feeling relieved, happy to be headed back to my house and get the hell out of here. But things never work out that way, do they? By the cars, we see a road that goes straight up a hill through the trees. At the start of it, there's a big metal gate that had a road close sign on it, which we had seen before, but for some reason it had never occurred to us to try and go up the road there. We had a small debate at the gate about an evenish split on who wanted to venture up and who didn't want to. I absolutely didn't want to, but eventually we decide we'll go up just to see. Both of the drivers want to go, so there's not a lot that we can do about it. We climb over the gate and start up the hill, where an old pavement road is cracked and crumbling under our feet, though it was for sure a real asphalt road at some point. In addition to the road condition and the brush being an obstacle, someone had torn down a bunch of trees over the path, purposely blocking off the road from any cars. Some of us are starting to seriously question if we should even be doing this, arguing that someone obviously wanted to keep us out of here, but we get teased for being afraid, and so we keep going. I couldn't see where the road would end, because it was so dark. We had a few flashlights, but it wasn't doing us much good, and the tree made it hard to see. Plus, the road wasn't super, super steep, so all you could really see was up, with a little moonlight peeking through the trees. All of a sudden, though, we reach the end. The trees just open up and we have come off the incline to a flat field. And holy hell what a sight it was. It's the flat field with all tall prairie grass on either side. Probably two to three feet high and pretty uniform to be honest. The path we are on splits the large clearing we're in down the center and leads through the grass to a cul-de-sac with three building. Two look like they're a farmhouse with one barnish building. They were wood, and while they might have been painted at one point, it looked like they had been mostly weathered and stripped by time. I see this, and I'm done with what's going on. I want to leave. But of course, of course, some of my friends say that we have to check out these buildings. At this point, I finally put my foot down, as do the other two girls, as well as one of our guy friends, who decided this is enough for him. I mean, he was sort of our valedictorian, so maybe he was just smarter. So the three guys who want to go to the buildings just tell us to just wait there, and while we don't want to be in this field, out in the open, we decide we can't just leave them. At this point, we've turned off our flashlights, because the moonlight is so strong. The three of them take off down the little path and the four of us who remain stand together, bitching about how stupid our friends are and making small talk in the same time. None of us say it, but we're all looking to the grass every now and again, worried something is going to jump out. It's just so creepy. This abandoned little settlement, it feels like our friends are gone forever. We see them get to a building and go inside. It was unlocked, I guess. But we can see the flicker of their flashlights in the windows, and I just remember feeling so tense. It was like watching a horror movie in real life. After maybe 10 minutes, though it could have been just a tense 5, we see our guy friends coming towards us, lightly jogging, looking afraid for the first time all night. You idiots went inside, I said, pissed off at them. One of my friends just looks at us, and I'll never forget it. It was full of bikes, just bikes chained to the walls. We didn't believe them. We kept waiting for them to say that they were just joking around, but they insisted 
They said it was like they were just storing a bunch of bikes there, most of them smaller. They looked afraid, and as much as I didn't want to believe them, I did. They aren't the type of guys to pull a prank for this long. By then, we can all agree that we need to get the hell out of there. And so we start down the hill, hurrying the best that we can. But all of a sudden, about halfway down the field, we can see a car's headlights down the hill, about where our cars are. We see them pass slowly, and we know someone is down there looking for us. Because it's so far off the beaten path, we figure it has to be one of two things. One, the cops, and we're going to be in trouble for trespassing. Two, the people who own this land or these houses or something, they're going to A. Call the cops or B. Murder us. We know that that road isn't that long, so they'll be turning around circling back soon enough, and because our cars are there, they'll most likely end up waiting for us. We're all whispering about this as we now pick up the pace, sprinting down the hill as fast as we can. Now, I'm not a good runner, but I was hauling ass, getting down as fast as I could, basically hurtling over the fallen trees. Once we get down the hill, we don't see any headlights, but we know they can't be far away. Get in the damn cars, one of our friends yells, and we're fumbling with the doors like a horror movie, just too nervous to get inside the vehicles. We get in, and just as we start the cars up, we see the headlights speeding down the road, a giant black truck roaring up behind us. The truck seemed larger than life, raised up off the ground. The whole thing was terrifying, but extra terrifying was that we couldn't see who was driving in the dark and with the headlights blinding us. We end up peeling out of there, total pedal to the metal. This truck, however, is still following us, bearing down on us as our two cars race out of there. The car is also getting really close, threateningly close. Almost like it was trying to run us off the road. We're all screaming at this point, looking back at the truck, fighting for some distance. Once we get to the highway, however, we're switching lanes, trying to escape. Luckily, we were in sedans, so it was easier for us to weave in and out of cars. But this truck is still chasing us. We are in two different lanes but don't want to get too separated from our friends. The passengers of both cars are texting back and forth, and we're trying to make a plan. It took us about 15 minutes to lose the truck. Now, I'm not sure if the distance was too much, or if they turned around, but once we got to a big shopping center area, we ducked off the road and into a sonic parking lot. We all sat in our cars for a little bit, watching to make sure we weren't going to get snuck up on before getting out of the car to get some food and talk. Everyone, even the guys who had tried to act tough the whole time, were pretty shaken up. It took us a while to settle down enough to head home, and as much as we talked it over, we couldn't figure out what happened. Eventually, however, we all went home, during what was a pretty silent car ride, exhaustion and lingering fear taking over. We didn't talk about it again for a long time, and we never called the police. Which, honestly, as an adult now, I feel like we should have done that. I don't think about it often, only during the fall, really. But when I do think about it, I ask myself, who chased us? Why was that town abandoned? Who owned those bicycles? And where are they now? Edit. A year later. This post is archived now, so I can't comment on it. But I think I may have a lead on this, so I figured I would post that. Someone messaged me with their guess on the location. And while I don't think it was correct... 
I searched a little for Hell's Church on a website about haunted places in Ohio, and I reread the part of it being by an exit ramp for Route 32 in Batavia. My guess is that we might have turned near JCM Equipment Management and then taken either Ross or Lookout Drive into the woods. The only thing is I can't make out the clearing in the woods, though between Ross and Rosebush in the woods, there does seem to be a building or two. I'm still trying to find it from time to time, and I'm still on the case. I worked at a local government agency for a long time. Each summer, we would get a new crop of interns. Most were fine. Some caused issues, like when we caught two of them making out in the file room. But overall, they were just normal kids from high school or college trying to get some work experience. In 2016, my department received an intern later than usual, right in the middle of the summer. Warner was a bit older than the usual crowd, around my age, maybe late 20s. We initially hit it off pretty well, and although I found him sort of strange, I didn't mind him since he was friendly and we had some common interests. He was the only person in my department who was even close to my age. The interns were all teenagers, and the regular staff averaged around 60 years old, older than my mom. I was psyched to have a peer to chat with, so occasionally I would eat lunch with Warner or stop to talk at his cubicle. His strangeness was mostly an outsized personality, a mix of over-the-top enthusiasm with a bit of social awkwardness, but I got zero bad vibes from the guy. It wasn't long before Warner started having major performance problems at work. He would produce little to no work on most days, no show or arrive late without informing anyone, and generally acted unprofessional. One day, he showed up for work at 3.15pm, when our workday ended at 4.30. The office manager was livid and told him to go home. His behavior bothered nearly everyone in my office, but I did not supervise him, and we had plenty of slacker interns in the past. While his antics were a bit of a spectacle, it wasn't a big deal to me. If you're wondering why he wasn't let go, two words, political favor. I found out from Warner himself that he was hired because his uncle donated to the campaign of our big boss. He wasn't going anywhere. Near the end of that summer, I put in my notice that I was leaving my job and I was going to relocate to a new state. Once Warner caught wind of this, he would constantly complain that it sucked I was leaving because we barely had time to become friends. I would always laugh lightly in response and give him a sympathetic, yeah. He would start to monopolize my time at work more and more, and it became disrupted to the people who sat near me. I found it slightly annoying, but I also was extremely happy to be leaving that job for reasons unrelated to Warner, and I spent my last month there not caring much about what my co-workers thought. I tolerated him lingering by my desk. One day, he caught me leaving work and offered me a ride home. I usually took the bus, and occasionally other co-workers would offer me rides home if they were going my way, so this didn't seem odd to me. I accepted, and I walked to his car with him. It smelled awful and was full of garbage. He hastily cleared off the passenger seat and apologized and we got on our way. But once we were on the main road, he started begging me to stop and get dinner with him. I laughed and said he didn't need to ask me that insistently, and said that we could stop at a diner on the way. We had a nice meal, with pleasant conversation. He was intelligent, and had a variety of interests, our political positions aligned, and we shared disdain for our cranky old co-workers. I had a good time. I expressed that he didn't need to drive me all the way home now that it was late, but he
but he kept insisting, so I relented. As I directed him toward my house, he started in again with a whining about how our developing friendship was cut short because I was moving. At this point, I was tired of hearing this. The decision to leave my job and move away from home was extremely difficult to make and I was proud of how bold I was being. I stopped responding and laughing and his whining faded out. We came up to the turn to get onto my street and when I pointed it out, he accelerated and drove right past it, laughing. I laughed in an OMG, WTF way, thinking he was joking around. When I began giving instructions about how to turn around and get back, he started begging me to keep hanging out with him because he was lonely. This immediately sent me on high alert. It suddenly hit me that I'm in a man's car, someone I don't know that well, who doesn't exercise proper behavior at work, which is the only context I know of him, and now he's displaying weird behavior outside of work as well. My instinct was to not insist I be let out of his car. I felt as if this was going to escalate the situation into something really bad. And in hindsight, it may have been the right thing to do when I think about the type of person he turned out to be. I told him we could hang out at the park near my house if he wanted to talk. He seemed to like that idea, and we parked and walked over. The pleasant conversations resumed. Besides the weird clinginess, he was perfectly fine to talk to. That is until he dumped his entire life story on me, including his prior arrest for theft, his heroin addiction, and related struggles with depression. I tried to be sympathetic, but I was very put off by this. It was a lot of highly personal information all at once, and I was still on alert because of his prior behavior. I tried changing the subject by showing him pictures of my dog. I scrolled one pic too far, and the next one was a photo of me wearing makeup and posing cutely, way different than the slob I was at work. He grabbed the phone and went, Wow, you are very photogenic. I felt awkward and didn't say anything. There was a long silence. Then he launched into a weird tangent about how compatible we are and that we have similar interests, etc, etc, and that he wishes I wasn't moving so we could try hanging out again, but on a date. I didn't say anything and he broke the silence with, sorry I'm saying all of this, I'm actually high right now. That's why I know where Riverside bad neighborhood that had previously come up in conversation is located. I went there yesterday to buy, otherwise I wouldn't have said it. I'm really sorry. Internally, I freaked out. He had definitely put his drug addiction in the past tense and I assumed it was something he was recovering from, not currently using. I also realized I had been in a car he was operating while he was under the influence. I don't know anything about heroin, so I was clueless. I felt very, very stupid. He immediately started whining and begging me not to judge him or hate him, and kept saying over and over again how nice I am and how understanding I am. He's even saying I'm pretty and smart, and all these weird compliments interspersed with talking down about himself. I didn't know what to do. So I smiled reassuringly and told him not to worry, but that I was tired and wanted to go home. That's when he started crying. He has this weird, wheezy sob, but no tears were coming out. I sat there silently while he did his thing, trying to come up with some sort of graceful escape plan. My patience was wearing thin, and my anxiety was through the roof. It's a weird feeling to be annoyed and panicky at the same time. I stood up and apologized, said the park was close to my house, so I'll walk, and started to leave when I remembered I left my stuff in his car. Trying a new approach, I casually mentioned I forgot my stuff in his car, and joked that if he wanted my dirty lunch containers, he could keep them. He seized 
his bizarre crying, stood up and ran over to his car to unlock it and I grabbed my stuff out of his back seat. His demeanor changed drastically as he calmly apologized for making things weird and asked if he could drop me off at home so I didn't have to walk alone at night. I said yes, but made him drop me off a block over from my little side street so he wouldn't see which house was mine. I could end it there, but what bothered me the most about this guy happened after this encounter. I'll make this part short. A week or two after the weird evening, end of August by this point, I had my last day at the job and moved 1,000 miles across the country. Warner would sometimes text me long ramblings, detailing his feelings about himself and about our missed opportunity. So I didn't respond to these messages. Now that I wasn't near him, I didn't feel the need to placate. The text messages stopped after a few weeks, and I forgot about him. Fast forward to February, and I get a text message from a former co-worker. Her message said, Sorry you had to hear about it this way. And her next message was a link to a local news article titled, man dies from wounds in Riverside stabbing a Wednesday. Because of the way she worded it, I thought Warner was the victim, but when I read the article, it included his mugshot and the charges. He was the attacker, and he murdered someone. I felt so shocked and disgusted, I couldn't believe I knew someone who killed another human being. Later on, I called an old work friend for some details. Apparently, shortly after I left the job, he was fired for trashing the men's bathroom. Like, just threw around anything he could lift and poured all the soap out and smeared it all over the place. He then lost his apartment. Presumably, some of the articles about his stabbing describe Warner as a homeless man. I have to assume that's how he ended up in the aforementioned Riverside. There are a lot of homeless drug addicts who squat in abandoned homes. I wondered if the man he stabbed had refused to give him something that he wanted, and that is how he reached a hard no. I don't think I made all the wisest decisions during my interactions with Warner, but I'm glad I was able to avoid setting him off, since he was clearly not stable. Hands down the worst intern I've ever encountered. This is a fresh story as it happened yesterday. So I was on my way back home from the city center, 9 to 10 p.m., and I had a sandwich with me. I have to take this bus to get home with maybe 16 stops until it's mine, which is not a busy stop. Usually only me, and sometimes one more person gets off there. I got on the bus at the back door, and the minute I sat down, this drunk guy comes to me and asks if I speak Hungarian. There are relatively a lot of beggars around here, so I'm not surprised. I say, no, which was a lie, so I avoid further conversation. He then starts speaking to me in English, and says could I give him some money for food. I say, no, I haven't got any Hungarian currency on me right now. Again, that was a lie because I just wanted to eat my damn sandwich. This guy then proceeds to signal me to give him a piece of my sandwich and almost breaks a piece off of my sandwich. So I say to him, sorry dude, no offense, but I just want to eat my sandwich. At first he seemed pretty chill about it, but this is when it gets interesting. He sits back on his seat, three seats behind me, and I notice he's not alone. He is with two equally drunk gentlemen. The bus now closes its doors and starts. As I'm eating my sandwich, I hear these guys talking shit about me in Hungarian, assuming I don't understand it. Stuff like, man this dickhead won't give me a piece of his sandwich, what a prick. Man, I would so bash his head in with a glass. I'm so angry. I hear them agree on getting down at my stop so that they can beat me up. I never had a deal with a situation like this, so I start to think and come to the conclusion 
that my best option is to get down at my stop and run home, but not on the usual route. I would run like hell, because I can easily outrun three 30-year-old drunk guys. Meanwhile, because I'm focused on what to do, I don't touch my sandwich, maybe a quarter of it remaining. This got them even angrier. Hey man, he didn't even finish his sandwich. I bet he gets home and throws it in the trash. Then one of them said he murdered someone in his dream. The other one says he dreamt the same thing too, and that this is not a coincidence. I'm there like surely they aren't that barbaric, but I was wrong. I hear them discussing my height, my weight, and buffness, and agree that they can take me easy three on one. At this point I'm sweating and thinking about all the other options because my stop is coming up. We're heading into the suburbs and the bus is starting to get empty. Then I realized I can pretend that I get off somewhere and hope they got off, so I decided to do that. At the last relatively busy bus stop before mine, I stood up and went to the front door where four other people stood waiting to get off. The bus stops and I start to go towards the door, but I stop when they can't see me. Surprise, surprise, they got off. The guy starts walking to my door calmly because there were other people at the stop, but when he got to my door, luckily, it closed. I checked if anyone got off with me at my stop though. I think this could have gone so much more worse, and I was lucky to get the best case scenario. So crazy drunk guys on the bus. Let's not meet. P.S. I ate the rest of the sandwich at home. Some quick backstory here. I work at a gas station on a main route. We see a lot of travelers passing through. Only one person works each shift, and it's a 24-hour store. Now bear in mind, we are short-staffed, so I agree to an overnight. By the way, I'm female. I work in a state that's always had self-serve gas stations. So this guy comes in. I asked him if he needed any help, and he says no. He's getting gas at the pump, but needs to use the bathroom. I go back to work on whatever invoices we got yesterday. The guy uses the bathroom, and then goes back outside. About five to seven minutes later, he comes back inside and tells me that he's confused about the pump. He directly says, you might have to come outside to help me. Customers don't often say this, they usually just complain that it's not working, so I'm already feeling weird about this guy. Nevertheless, I shake it off because he looks like a nerd, and I don't feel really afraid of him. I look at the register to see what error it came up with for his pump, and there's no errors. The register doesn't even say it was in use. Even if someone tries to pay and nothing's wrong with their payment, it will at least say payment slash loyalty timed out. But literally, it had no sign of him trying to use it before asking me for help. I ask him if he wants to just pay inside. He agrees to, gets his wallet out of his car, and then pays $10. I give him his receipt, and he says, Can you help me? I don't understand the machine. And I say, We aren't really allowed to leave the store during overnight shifts, as it's just me here, and it's not safe to go outside. I don't know why I told him I was alone, but he wasn't seemingly threatening. He proceeds to say, I don't understand what it's asking me. I need help. I'm not scary. I tell him again that I can't go outside because it's a store policy for the overnight shift, and I say, it's not that you're scary. I just can't go outside. I would have to tell a little old lady asking for help at this hour the same thing. Which, by the way, is true. We can't even take out the trash during overnights. He starts to walk away from the register counter now, 
but then again stops at the door and asks me one last time to come outside and help him. I'm pretty annoyed at this point. I've said no twice now. Look, I'm not going, so stop asking, I finally say in a super annoyed tone. Okay, all you need to do is 1. Pick up the nozzle. 2. Select the fuel grade button. And 3. Put it into your tank and squeeze the handle. I'm not going outside. Then he finally goes back to the car and the register tells me he had no trouble pumping gas. Also, his plates seem like they're from the state I work in. This kind of thing wouldn't have made me suspicious usually, but the fact that he originally opted for me to go outside instead of bringing money inside at 3 a.m. is weird, along with how he didn't bother to use the pump before he came inside to ask for help, claiming it wasn't working, and him not taking my first no for an answer. No means no. So, potential gas station abductor. Let's not meet again. When I was seven or eight, my family went to the beach and rented a room. We had the kind of rooms where you rent out both and they connect through a door. Like there's the doors to leave the room and the doors to the other room. In the room connected to ours, there was this army family, military dad, some kids, and a wife. My older sister was supposed to be watching me as we were down at the jacuzzi during the evening. As we're playing and hanging out and just having an overall good time, I didn't get out much. I was naive and all around a little kid. We're both white skinned, blue eyes, and blonde hair. This mom literally sits in the jacuzzi with us. She starts talking to us and is just making herself really comfortable. I was a very naive kid. Eventually we start talking books and she's talking about her kids who are never even seen and we're just having a good conversation. Really in depth I felt like. My sister decides she wants to go back to the room but I myself don't. I wanted to stay and talk with the mom. So my sister goes back to the room and now it's just 7 year old me and some 40 year old woman. It should have set off some creepy alarms but it did not. So she starts talking about going and walking on the beach. Bear in mind it's like 10 p.m. and she wants to go walk on the beach and get shells. I thought it was a great idea. I'd get to walk on the beach at night. I felt so free, and honestly, like a big kid. I didn't need my sister or anything. So I run back to the room and tell my grandparents that I'm walking on the beach with Sue. I remember my grandmother reading her book as she was barely listening to what I said. She just shoot me off. It is important to know I didn't live with my parents. So I start walking down the creepy motel corridor. Really was a dark dim stairwell at a cheap motel on the beach. So I'm going through the stairwell like something out of a movie. Too bad I'd never seen this movie. So I'm walking through the stairwell. The mom's way at the bottom telling me to hurry up and this and that. While walking through the stairs, army dad comes running hauling ass to where I'm at. He told me, your mom is calling you, it's really important, we gotta go, and basically grabbed me by the wrist, softly, not aggressively, and led me back to our room. He knocked on the door and explained what had happened. I never thought much of it, until about a year ago when it came back to me. This woman was leading me away to the beach alone at night. And this army guy got a terrible feeling in his gut. So that's why he intervened. When he said my mom was looking for me, as I don't live with my mom, it set off some alarms in my head. That's when I realized that 
something was up, so I didn't resist going back to my family. As a kid, I knew since he was saying my mom wanted me, it was important. I just knew something was up, because again, I don't live with my mom. I'm now 20 years old, and I truly believe that mom was trying to lure me away to God knows what, and this army dude had a bad feeling, and honestly, saved my life. Thinking back, I get such a bad feeling all throughout my body. I know now I wouldn't have made it back from that beach trip. Thank you, army dude. Your gut feeling and having a watchful eye saved something terrible from happening to me. That woman was creepy, and I never saw her kids. Edit, I was either seven or eight. I'm not trying to switch it up on y'all. I'm just telling an old memory. I haven't thought about it in forever. Sorry for the confusion. Edit number two. I feel as though she was working with someone trying to take me somewhere. Not so much that she was the predator, but was working with a predator and was taking back her prize because she was adamant about getting me alone on the beach on the other side of the pier. I remember following her like in a trance. No warning bells. No, hey, this is a terrible idea. Nothing. Just innocence and planning what I wanted to do with my shells. Almost like the quiet was a warning sign as well. This is another story that happened in college. During my final year in college, I was living in a two-bedroom on-campus apartment with four other girls. My actual roommate, Christine, is a sweetheart, and we're still like sisters even now, after over ten years of friendship. That was our third year rooming together, and we even signed up for the same summer abroad programs. We like to joke we've used up all of our roommate luck by finding each other because all of our sweet slash apartment mates were interesting. The rest don't warrant individual stories on their own, so I'll just type it up in the comments. The other two girls sharing our apartment were Chelsea and Brittany. Chelsea was normal, but Brittany was problematic. She would always bring different guys home every night, which was fine, except for the fact that she was in a relationship with a cop who, bear in mind, carried a gun everywhere with him and he had serious anger and jealousy issues. Oh, and she'd have sex all over every surface of the apartment. The night that this happened, there was a St. Patrick's Day party with free concerts happening in the school, so there were loads of people on campus. Brittany and Chelsea have gone off to party, but Christine and I decided to stay at home so we can binge on Friends reruns because we're so cool lame. In the middle of our Friends binge, we heard someone hammering at our door. Hey, can you let me in? I need to borrow your phone. It was a male voice. We immediately assumed it was one of Brittany's guys. Sometimes they would make up stories just to get into her apartment and then refuse to leave until she comes back so they can hook up and get into a shouting match, usually cheating related. What should we do? Christine whispered to me. I knew what she wanted, but she was too nice to say it, so I said it for her. Let's pretend we're not in and not answer. We were in no mood to entertain a guy for a few hours while he waited for Brittany to get back. The guy banged on our door and asked to borrow our phone several times, but eventually he gave up and left. We had fun watching the rest of the episode when suddenly our phones buzzed. We both checked our phones and it was an automatically generated campus wide alert text there was a stabbing on campus, and it was in our very own apartment and happened in the unit right above ours. The stabber was identified as a male 
and he was still on the loose. I looked at Christine and asked her, Uh, could it be? She looked unsure, but went, Nah, it couldn't. Yeah, it, it couldn't. We made sure we barricaded the door to our room before we slept, just in case Brittany brought Mr. Stabby home. I mean, she doesn't. Yes, present tense, have the best taste in men. The next day, we read the school paper to find out more about the incident. Apparently, the guy knocked on the victim's door, asking to borrow her phone. She let him in, and as soon as he was inside the apartment, he grabbed a knife from the kitchen countertop and stabbed her multiple times in the stomach. He was a complete stranger, and it seems that his only motivation is to stab someone. Since the campus was filled with thousands of people during the party, the guy easily slipped into the crowd and disappeared. Our apartment was on the ground floor and right next to the stairs. If someone was going to knock on every apartment, our apartment was most likely right before the victim's apartment. Christine and I definitely spent a few minutes shouting, Holy shit. Oh my god. It turned out having a shitty apartment mate might have saved us. And yes, there was an article about it in the news. Here is a detail that isn't in that article, however. The apartment was Levy 6. If you were a fellow lion during that time, you'd remember that it was a month after there was a shooting over a high school basketball game that was hosted on campus. Fortunately for me, I was graduating in two months, so my mom couldn't pull me out of LA and make me move back to Indonesia ASAP. Yeah, my mom received the alert too. She knew our apartment's layout, and so she also pieced everything together and realized it could have been me or Christine. So this happened to me back in November. I am 13 now. But when this encounter took place, I was 12. I live in Tbilisi, Georgia, and I live in an apartment and a pretty safe part of town. The only scary thing that has happened to me before this was a criminal living in the very same block as me. A few years ago, he set a fellow resident's car on fire in the middle of the night. He was of course arrested after that. So this story starts in a local park that also doubles as a huge playground. A lot of kids and elderly people like being there. I was out with my friends and we were spinning on one of those spinning carousels and we were talking about video games. But suddenly, I spotted an old man, but I didn't think much of it since a lot of elderly people hang around here. But I had a weird gut feeling about him. He was making me feel what I can only describe as unsafe but I thought it was just the spinning carousel that was giving my brain a hard time because I'm always dizzy after that ride and I stopped paying attention to him. A few minutes later, myself and my friends decide to leave the park because we're getting bored. While we're walking, I see that same man. This time his stare is fixated on my best friend. We don't think much of it and we keep walking. We get close to him and he quickly steps in front of us and says, Hey kids, my first thought was that he was going to ask us for directions. Because that happens a lot in that part of town I live in, many people are often confused about where to go. And he follows it up with, Would you happen to want some of my goodies? Being the idiot that I am, instead of walking away, I ask, What goodies? He goes silent and starts staring at me. A few moments of silence, and then, some of these here drugs. He opens his coat wide and reveals pockets full of tiny Ziploc bags filled with powdery substances. My friend quickly and silently says, no thanks, and we start speed walking towards my house. I live in an apartment very close to that park, and my friends live in the same block and building, just one door away from mine on the fifth floor. He then starts following us in a rather quick manner, 
and almost shouts, What about some candy? I got some candy too. At this point, me and my friend start darting towards our block, not even looking either way while he's running across the road. Luckily, there were no cars around, and once we got to our block, we felt much safer. There were a few people sitting there on the benches, and everyone in the block knew us, so if this old man tried anything, we knew that we were going to be safe. Anyway, I told my parents the moment I got home, they called the cops, and to this day, the guy has yet to be found. I never thought I'd have anything to post on this subreddit, but here I go. This literally just happened, so I'll try to keep this as short and organized as possible, but I apologize if it's neither of those two things. I'm a 29-year-old female, and my partner is a 23-year-old female. We are back in her hometown visiting her family for about a week. It is a very small, isolated town in the middle of nowhere and basically in the middle of the woods. While we were here, she wanted to meet up with an old high school friend who still lives in the area. We're going to call him Kyle. So we meet Kyle at the beach and right away he's acting super weird and making jokes about having a three-way with us and just making a bunch of unwelcome, overly sexual, gross comments about us. Obviously, we're unfortunately used to this stuff to a certain extent, but coming from someone who was supposed to be her good friend, it was extra annoying. So, me and my girlfriend are shooting each other panicked looks the whole time. Once he's out of earshot for a second, she says that she's sorry that he's never been like this before and we can make an excuse to leave. When he comes back, we tell him we want to get dinner at a local bar, but he just asks to join us. We felt awkward, so we end up saying yes. He says he doesn't know how to quite get there, so he ends up following us. We get there, order drinks and food, and then head out to the patio with the drinks. He makes a few more gross comments, but is generally being way more cool and normal than he was at the beach. We're smoking weed on the patio and just chilling. The food comes quick and we finish it quicker. Now here's where it gets really messed up. So halfway through my first drink, I'm feeling really tired, which makes sense as we've had a long day. I give my girlfriend the signal that I want to go. She makes an excuse that, obviously, we need to go, but he keeps trying to get us to come to his house. I've got good weed and dabs there, and you can meet my cats, blah blah blah. He's being really pushy, but we keep saying no and making excuses, we need to go check on our grandpa, etc. So finally we get in the car and say goodnight, we've parked next to each other and walk up and into the cars together while saying our goodbyes. When we get in the car, my girlfriend informs me that she wants to stay at the bar, but fake it like we're leaving because she doesn't want to chill with him anymore, understandably. So we're sitting in the car waiting for him to leave first, when he signals for us to roll down the window. We do, and he says, his GPS is being funny and we can lead him to the main road. To be fair, we are in the middle of nowhere so this doesn't seem too outlandish. So obviously staying behind at the bar was out. So in the car, we're talking about how pushy he was being, and she admitted she feels weird driving right back to her grandpa's house, so we should drive into town until we lose him. He's behind us for a long time, even way after he should have gotten off on his exit. We think it's weird, but we're not sure what to do. So finally we get on a two lane road and he pulls up next to us and he's waving a phone which is clearly my girlfriend's phone in the window. We pull over and he gives her the phone back, chats for just a few seconds and then leaves in a hurry. Now here's the part that makes my skin crawl. We know she had her phone, 
I saw her put it in her fanny pack, which was on the table, along with my phone and her weed a few minutes before we left the bar as we were preparing to leave. She didn't take it back out. There is literally no way she could have left it at the bar. More importantly, he got in his car and left the bar at the same time as us, meaning he had to have already had the phone when we were leaving. I mean, it's not like we left the bar first and then he saw it left on the table or something. He literally had to have been walking to the cars with us and calmly saying goodnight with a phone already in his possession. Now, the kicker. Apparently, unbeknownst to me, my girlfriend had tasted a very weird bitter taste in her straw at the bar and was already suspicious, especially with how he'd been acting. This is why she wanted to stay back at the bar, to get away from him and stay in public where she felt it was safer. So when he walked up to the car to return her cell phone, she very casually and deliberately flashed the knife that she had kept for protection in her jacket. I didn't know at the time that she had done this, so that's why he had left so quickly. Obviously, I was annoyed with her for not telling me her suspicions sooner, but she just didn't want me to panic. I'm really shaken up, and a few things are clear. 1. He stole my girlfriend's phone, and it seems like he did so so that we would be forced to pull over on a dark road in the middle of nowhere. 2. He quickly ended the conversation and left when my girlfriend flashed her knife. They'd been good friends for almost 10 years. If he wasn't planning on doing something malicious, I feel like he would have acted confused about the knife or said something like, like, what the hell are you doing? Why would you flash a knife at me? What, is this a bad movie or something? But instead, he just booked it, which tells me he knew exactly what she was doing, reacting to a threat and preparing to protect herself and me. 3. He probably spiked our drinks. My girlfriend noticed a weird taste in her straw right away and chose not to finish her drink. I finished half of mine and I felt very tired. A few more things. I just don't know how he managed to nab the phone without us knowing or noticing. It doesn't really make any sense, but he did. Me and my girlfriend both remember her putting her fanny pack perfectly. We also have no idea how he could have spiked our drinks, unless he was working with the bartender, but we were the ones who suggested that bar. I don't know exactly how he did it, but I think I know why, and for that reason, my girlfriend's now ex-friend, who made creepy sexual comments, probably tried to drug us and stole her phone in order to get us alone on a dark road. But anyway, let's not meet again. This isn't scary per se, but it's always creepy when someone you've known forever and thought of like a mentor is revealed to be something much, much different. So I had this boss, who I'll call Mike, and he had come to fill in for a few months while my regular boss was on maternity leave. He was pretty amazing. He inspired me to work harder and even ended up promoting me. The two of us and a third employee that I'll call James were always working shifts together. It was fun, just laughing and kicking ass because we all had a similar sense of humor and James and I were definitely the best employees there. After Mike's time to fill in was over, James and I were super bummed because he was seriously the best manager. He was fair and rewarded hard work and truly cared about employee satisfaction. Plus, he just made everything fun even though we were working harder. We both looked up to Mike as a manager and as a human being. We had the utmost respect for him and we vowed to keep in touch when we parted ways. Well, fast forward a year or so, James and I ended up dating. We kept in touch with Mike 
and he was so happy we ended up together because he thought we were both great people who really deserved each other. We saw Mike a few more times and we kept in touch over the years through social media when James proposed and we started planning our wedding. We knew we wanted Mike to be part of it. He was part of our trio before James and I knew we would be together after all and the three of us had a bond. We asked him to read something during the ceremony and he accepted, expressing how honored he felt. Well, when it got to the day of the wedding, Mike was nowhere to be seen. We kept calling him as the ceremony was quickly approaching, and finally, James got a hold of him. Mike told him he couldn't get out of work and wouldn't be able to make it. We were both taken aback a little bit, because the Mike we knew and looked up to would never bail like this and not even let us know about it. We figured there had to be some reasonable explanation and were pretty disappointed, but the wedding had to go on. We had James's niece do the reading, even though Mike's name was printed in the program. Well, fast forward again, a few more years. We had only spoken to Mike a handful of times since the wedding, but he had also taken the time to write me a beautiful, lengthy recommendation letter in that time period. There were no hard feelings about the wedding, and James and I still shared the highest of opinions on our friend. Then Mike kind of disappeared off the of social media, and the next time we tried calling him, his phone number had changed. James and I exchanged sentiments of concern and hoped he was doing okay, but it didn't go much past that. One day, James got a random call from a number that wasn't in his contact list. He answered it, and it turned out to be Mike, so he put it on speakerphone so I could say hello as well. We had our brief pleasantries, but then Mike got into the reason for his call. He wanted to know if he could stay with us for a day or two. My initial reaction was, of course, but James shot me a sharp look. So I added, well, let us discuss it and we'll call you back. Before concluding the call, James inquired about what was going on. Mike said he'd been living with his father to care of him because he was terminally ill, but that he couldn't stay there another night because he checked the camera footage in their home and seen his dad on tape standing over him with a knife while he slept. When the call was ended, James said he thought something had to be off. I didn't really get why he'd instantly be that suspicious. I mean, the story was insane and all, but it was Mike. James said something like, we haven't heard from him in forever and now he's calling us for a favor? He lives two hours away, and where are the ones he calls? Why wouldn't he seek the help of someone closer? He has family in the area too. I agree that it was all odd, and it definitely conjured up a lot of questions, including why there were even cameras inside their house. But I still didn't like the idea of leaving Mike hanging if he was truly out of options. I told James we should call back and probe a little bit more. When we called back, James asked if it wouldn't be easier to have someone closer help him out and asked about family in the area. Mike gave a vague explanation of why everyone in his family had turned against him. Then with the most mopey, disappointed voice, he said it was okay if we couldn't help, that he understood what was going on and wouldn't bother us anymore. James and I looked at each other and said we call him right back. We quickly discussed that this was all very strange, but that he had to be pretty desperate to contact us for help. We acknowledged that his little bit about understanding if we were unable to help was meant to manipulate us, and we felt conflicted about everything. But ultimately, we decided a few days couldn't hurt. We called him back, we told him he could come and figured we'd give him the address and that was going to be that. But he said 
He no longer had a vehicle and would need to be picked up. We asked about catching an Uber and he said he had no money he could access at the moment, which we didn't pry him on. It was getting late and it was a long drive to his location, so we asked if he had anywhere to stay for the night and we would make the trip in the morning. He said he'd just sleep on a park bench or something, which again, we knew was meant to manipulate us, but we didn't cave in on that one. We asked where we should pick him up the following day, and he gave us his dad's address. Immediately after we got off the phone, we were like, what the hell has been going on with Mike that has ostracized him from all his friends and family and caused him to lose his car? He had been making four times our salary when we all first met. He had a brand new car, and now he didn't even have money for an Uber? We went and picked him up the next day, and I got out and ran up and gave him a hug. He seemed oddly unresponsive to my affection, so I just shrugged it off and showed him to the front passenger seat where I'd been sitting. He was super tall, so I let him sit up there, and I hopped in the back. When we got back to our house, we showed him to our guest room and he put his things down and then immediately asked if we could take him to the grocery store. James said he was done driving for the day, so I said I'd take him, but commented that I thought he didn't have any money on him. He told me he had food stamps, which there's no way he would have qualified for this with his old job, so I knew something was up but I wasn't going to dig into the personal details of his finances, so I just logged it in my mind, and I kept my mouth shut. Now, you might be thinking it just sounds like someone who fell on hard times, and that was basically Mike's story as well, but it was just very vague in important areas, and full of story after story about people that seemed determined to destroy him for no known reason whatsoever. One or two bad eggs is believable, but no one is the innocent victim in every scenario. He was telling us that he had no idea why his life had fallen apart and why those close to him seemed to turn on him out of nowhere, or why so many people were out to get him without seeming to have any sort of motivation. Two nights turned into a week, and finally James asked Mike what his plan was. Mike acted hurt and said he'd be gone by the morning. We told him he didn't need to leave immediately, but we'd like to have some kind of idea of his plan for going forward. That night, in bed, James and I discussed it and decided we'd tell Mike that he could stay for as long as he needed to, so long as he helped around the house, and to keep his room relatively clean, because it contained several antique items of James's mother's. We also were going to ask him to help me with some entrepreneurial decisions, as Mike had claimed to have been a totally self-made successful entrepreneur before this. Streak of bad luck, perhaps? A series of unfortunate events? I had recently been laid off, but we presented our offer the next day, and Mike excitedly accepted. Honestly, we thought it was going to be a rewarding trade-off for all parties. Now, this isn't a story about marriage, so I'm not going to go too far into the wealth of problems that James and I had, but a little information will be necessary. James was highly critical of me and often talked down to me and seemed to have nothing but negative opinions. I wasn't perfect, but I wanted to be loved. I worked my ass off for James's approval. I was constantly trying to make him happy, but no matter what I did, I would fail in his eye. After a few weeks, Mike clearly started to see the cracks in the marriage, despite the fact that James toned it down in Mike's presence. Trying to be a good wife, I acted like all was fine in front of Mike, and I never mentioned any dissatisfaction in my marriage. Mike and I started to spend a lot of time alone in our entrepreneurial pursuits. He was supposed to be teaching me the tricks of the trade within several avenues of making money, but we kept coming out with little success. He had excuses 
and explanations for why his wisdom didn't seem to be progressing us forward at all, but he was someone I greatly looked up to as a professional and a friend, so I just believed that it would all pay off soon like he said. After living together for weeks, enough talking among all of us had been done to start noticing weird contradictions to many of the things Mike had told us but he always worded things in a way that left a slight amount of room for doubt if he were to question any of it. There was never a way to straight up catch him in a lie. Mike also wasn't fulfilling his end of our deal at home and kept saying he'd take his turn to do the dishes and such, but probably only did it once or twice, and he completely trashed the guest room. Not only was there garbage everywhere, but he'd bring in food and drinks, and they'd be lost in the sea of clothing and trash, and we could smell things rotting as well. There was a melted tub of ice cream sitting on the bedside table for weeks. I didn't care as much as James did, but I suggested we just remove his mom's things from the room, but I did agree that it was disrespectful. Meanwhile, things were getting more and more icy with James and I, and one day, when I was out with Mike on a job, I broke down in tears about how much I was hurting about how James treated me. Mike offered words of comfort and, reluctantly, admitted that he picked up on how mean James could be to me and said he was very sorry and that I didn't deserve it. Mike, having been possibly the only witness I ever had to what I had been going through in my marriage, this was amazingly validating. Mike agreed that it was incredibly unjustified, but made me promise not to tell James that he'd said anything because he didn't want to appear like he was taking sides. The next day, Mike had once again volunteered to take a turn doing the dishes, so I didn't do them. I honestly hate doing dishes, and so I happily left them for Mike when he assured me he'd handle it. Well, Mike got a call which informed him that his dad didn't have long to live, so he wanted to go see him. James didn't seem at all interested in helping, so I volunteered to take him and stay for moral support, and we headed out. On the way to see his dad, Mike started to tell me his dad has dementia and makes up weird things, so he advised me not to take anything to heart. He cited a few examples of things he'd previously said and they were all more like accusations. One of them being that Mike had stolen all the money in his savings. I thought it was pretty odd, but I couldn't really reconcile the vast difference between the Mike I'd met eight years before and someone who could rob his dying father. While we were visiting his dad, I didn't say much as I didn't want to insert myself into a private family moment, but I kept noticing things that were weird. For example, his dad was fully conscious and talkative and didn't seem like he was a dying man at all. He even asked us to get him Burger King in the middle of it all. I kept trying to justify things in my head, like who am I to say a dying man can't want a final meal at Burger King? A few hours in, James called, irate that I had left him again without doing the dishes that Mike promised to do. He chewed me out and threatened divorce, which was always his go-to to try to whip me into shape and having the recent affirmation from Mike that I wasn't the only one who saw James's emotional abuse. I said, fine, divorce won't be thrown in my face anymore, so divorce it is. Back in Mike's dad's room, his dad was yelling about his will and money and such, and Mike looked at me in a way to signal that the dementia was talking. I would started to really question what happened with his dad and if he was really even dying at all, but it wasn't something I could really handle investigating at the moment, given that I'd just separated from my husband. When we left the hospital, Mike's dad was still alive and eating candy bars. I had nowhere else to go, so I went back home and slept upstairs on the couch. I didn't speak to James for two whole days, and then Mike said he'd talk to his mom and I could stay there for a week. I wondered why his mom wasn't the one helping him, 
if they were in contact and on good terms, but I just accepted the offer. I couldn't take being at that house anymore. Mike said he was going to go with me and stay there too, which I thought looked really bad, but he said he spoke to James and that he understood and was fine with it. I spent the entire week crying and talking to Mike about how I felt, and he even woke up in the middle of the night with me if I woke up and started spiraling downhill. He made no advances on me or anything of the sort. After the week, I went to stay with my parents, and Mike went back to stay with James. I eventually saw them both when I'd come over to get things, and in talking with James, he was very much ready for Mike to leave. They barely seemed to talk, and did not seem on good terms whatsoever. One night, I got the weirdest impulse to ask James if Mike ever said anything about me that he made him promise not to tell me. James hesitated for a second, but said yes. Through a series of questions, we inched through both of our experiences with Mike. He had been playing into our rapidly declining marriage and using everything he observed against us. He had been going out and teaching me things to make money and he did the same thing he did as my boss all those years before, told me my strengths and complimented my ability to catch onto things quickly. We didn't have much success, but it was very obviously not on account of me. However, he was going back and feeding into James's terrible opinion of me and claiming we weren't making any money because I was so dense and hard to teach. Mike would also comment on the very same things he told me were unacceptable that James did, except he'd tell James he doesn't know how he lives with someone like me and that he'd go insane. He was carefully and strategically forcing our marriage to fall apart by exacerbating our personal fears and insecurities and systematically validating and encouraging our resentment for one another. He did it in such a way that neither of us doubted his sincerity for a moment until I finally got a weird feeling and decided to ask that night. And even then I didn't really anticipate finding out that he had been two-faced and manipulative to that extreme. James kicked him out that night and neither of us have talked to him again. As far as I know, I haven't spoken to James in a year and a half. I proceeded with a divorce despite this, because even though Mike was an insecure piece of shit, he caused me to get enough distance from James that I was able to see I deserved so much better. Last I heard about Mike was from his mother, who called me to see why I'd been asked to abruptly leave James's house. I told her what he had done, and she didn't seem surprised at all. I asked if she was aware of any mental problems he may have had, and she said she didn't want to betray her son by giving details, but that he isn't right in the head. I asked him about several of the traumatic events that Mike had claimed to be the victim of, and she said there has never been evidence that any of it really happened. I don't know why he actively initiated the final downfall of my marriage, because I've never felt it was an attempt to be with me. I don't get what his motivations or gain would have been. Mike's mother texted me a few days after he left James's house, and she told me that he had been admitted into a psychiatric facility and wouldn't be out for a very long time. She wouldn't elaborate. So, former boss turned friend turned delusional sociopath. Let's not meet again. Hey there everyone, thanks for watching today's video. If you enjoyed, make sure to leave a like and make sure to leave a comment telling me what you thought. Also, if this is the first time you're joining us on the Creepy Fox Podcast, make sure to subscribe and turn on that notification bell. That way you'll be notified of any and all future uploads that are coming here to the Creepy Fox YouTube channel. Also, if you'd like to get yourself some Creepy Fox merch, then check right below the video. Whether it's shirts, stickers, sweaters, coffee mugs, you name it. Go ahead and check it out. Also, if you'd like to go ahead and support the channel too, 
you can consider becoming a channel member. Channel members get early access to brand new uploads, as well as exclusive videos that aren't available to anyone else. Now with that said, I would like to go ahead and give a thank you to the channel members. Thank you to Robbie, Spunky the Nutcase, Bo, Rice and Beans, Linz, Maribel, Dread Archive, Sean, Corey, Jen, and Sylvia. Thank you also to the regular viewers who watch the channel, leave likes, comments, and share the channel with their family and friends. Now with that said, I'll go ahead and see you all in the next episode of the Creepy Fox YouTube Podcast. Until then, take care and have yourself an amazing day.